Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Patrick with Stacking Layers. Today's video, I'm gonna do a quick review on the Big Tree Tech Pi, or as they label it, the BTT Pi. So this is Big Tree Tech's um, alternative to the Raspberry Pi. So, you know, as you probably already know, if you're interested in this type of tech, that uh, the chip shortages are still basically going on and the Raspberry Pis are still very difficult to get. Um, it uh, They're getting better. I've seen actually some some uh, storage or not storage, what would it be called? Some inventory ramping up. So it's starting to look good, but, uh, big tree tech still went out and, and did this alternative board to really, um, you know, supply the market and keep things going. And so far it's been a really great board. I've been very proud of it. Um, this is kind of like their second, uh, iteration to the, um, to the raspberry Pi alternative, uh, game i guess would be um this is uh this is the the full blown version as you can see um underneath the heat and sink here is the um all winner h616 chip and it is the same basic set setup as their starting package that they did which is the cb1 um cb1 was a raspberry pi cm4 alternative which is not a full computer like this guy is but um it's basically, it's the heart of that or the brains, I guess it would be. So you got your, the same thing, the all winner uh, H616 uh, chip and um, one gig of RAM, which of course this has. And uh, basically you would have to put it onto an adapter board to make it like the Raspberry Pi style thing like this, or um, which what it was originally designed for is you would put it onto a Manta board like you may have seen on my uh, Manta MAP to Canvas video. Um, and uh, that's really what it was mainly designed for, to kind of do a drop-in to make an all-in-one system like that. But really great that they take, took it a step further and they made a full-blown uh, Raspberry Pi style um, board because, um, you know, these things are not just for 3D printing. Of course, the, the main theme of them is 3D printing, especially with, with this one. Um, I'll point out a couple little features. Um, but, you know, there's the styling and everything about it. It's really geared towards being used with Clipper, um, Clipper firmware. And... Um, it's really nice, but at the same time, this is still a full-blown Linux computer, so you can do everything that you could with a regular Raspberry Pi, um, you know, running all sorts of other projects like home automation or data logging if you want to do like a weather station or a media center or uh, some kind of like a retro game system, you know, all, all sorts of different things you can do with this too. So it is still a full-on Linux computer. So as you can see, um, you got the GPIO output over here. You have four USB inputs, um, I guess input output. You have um, your ethernet cable, ethernet adapter. This is not a gigabit port, this is a 100 megabit, so um, it's not as fast as what's on the Raspberry Pi, but at the same time, it's, you know, I mean, it's not really that necessary, I suppose. Um, I actually never use it, I always use Wi-Fi, which is built in, so um, maybe a game, you know, not a, not a good thing for some people, but not a big deal. Um, and then you got your USB po power, you have HDMI in, uh, output, which supports up to 4K. It also has a headphone jack. So like I was talking about for Media Center, you can put a headphone jack. Um, then it's got a couple of things that uh, Raspberry Pi doesn't have. So here you have a uh, CAN bus um, jack. So this is designed for CAN bus. Now you do need to use a uh, CAN bus adapter. Um, that does not come with it. It's uh, like twelve dollars for this. It's a. It's basically what it is. It's a USB to CAN bus adapter, um, but it's designed specifically for this board. As you can see, there's these uh, two standoffs here, which are um, receptacles for these pins. So you have power on on this side, and then on this side you have the USB um, on those two pins, the the UART or the USB the data connection, and then on the other side you have the CAN bus um, transfer. So um, you plug that guy into here. If I could do this on camera, <laughs> yeah. Snap it into there, and now you have a CAN bus ready system. Um, it came fully loaded, ready to go. You don't have to do any extra flashing or anything like that. Um, you know, you do have to set up uh, whatever you're going to use for CAN bus, of course, to communicate through CAN bus. But um, this thing came ready to go. It's all pre-set up with CAN bus running, so that was a really nice touch. Didn't have to do anything there. Of course, you can. You can see you got a boot button here and your uh, USB input for doing if you want to flash some other firmware onto there. Of course, you can do that. Um, other things that it has is a, uh, a dedicated, um, fan port. Um, this is basically just broken out of one of these pins. I forget which one it is at the moment, but it's broken out for one of these pins and then you got your ground on the other side. So it's just to control that, um, which is nice, you know, to have cooling. Uh, you also have over here an SPI, um, output for the, uh, Big Tree Tech's, um, 
TFT 35 SPI screen, um, which I got here. I've, I went through and purchased the whole pack. I just, you've probably seen some other videos with me showing this screen, but yeah. So this is the SPI screen and it uses a ribbon cable. So yeah, one of these cables. So you just put that in there, of course, there, and then the other one on here and away you go. Um, you do have to enable uh, for the screen. You do have to go into um, the uh, firmware, or sorry, the, the OS for this guy that, that it, of course, Big Tree Tech supplies, and then enable uh, the overlays, or basically uncomment the overlay for the SPI, um, the TFT35 SPI, and then that's it, and you reboot and the screen turns on. Um, as long as you got it plugged in right. I, I've noticed some people have a lot of problems with that. They don't have it plugged in right. So the blue tab on these, um, first let me show you. So yeah, I guess it's not gonna be good on the camera. So you have opposite connectors. You see how it's, you got the pins on this side and then a blue ribbon on that side. You got the pins on the other side there, all right? Blue and blue. So it's reverse. So if you follow, you can see follow, there's the pins on that side and then you keep going, keep going. So I'm pulling it straight and then it's the blue side. So basically they're on opposite sides. If you get an extension ribbon and the the pins are not on both are are not on opposite sides of the cable, they're on the same side. That's not going to work. You're going to have to either peel off the the blue part here and make sure that you have all the pins nicely exposed, or get the right one. You need the reverse one. So, anyways, blue the blue part goes on this side, facing inward. So basically, facing the little black uh, locking mechanism that's right here like that. And then the same thing on this side, the blue goes up again, facing the little me locking mechanism. So it goes up. So just wanted to point that out because I've seen a lot of people struggling with this and I lot many of them, they end up putting the cable this way or like that. And that's not going to work. It's backwards. So anyways, yeah, I just want to point that out, but moving on. <laughs> I, I didn't really want to do a tutorial on this one. I just kind of want to show my opinions, but I've seen so many people struggling. So I wanted to point that out. If you guys are looking to, to buy this board, it's your first time seeing it. Keep that in mind. Next over here is another SPI um, breakout. It's actually, it's it's not specific to SPI because it is just debt to some of these pins over here again. So you have your power ground and then there's four other pins. Um, but it is originally designed to be used with the... Um, uh, ADXL uh, accelerometer for doing like input shaping and stuff like that. So um, you don't have to use it dedicated to that. That is what it was made for. But of course, all you need to do is make a, a connector that goes in there. And then you have, you know, a cable that's hooked up to four of these SPIs plus, or sorry, of these uh, uh, GPIO pins. Um, and then uh, you have ground and power. So nice, nice thing. Ground and power and four pins. It's, it's pretty handy to have it on a cable. The next over, See this guy, you might be familiar with that kind of a design. It is a power input, which I think is probably one of my most favorite features of this because this gives you the ability to hook up 12 or 24 volts in direct. You don't need to have any special adapters or um, butt converters or anything like that to, to get your power step down to five volts and plug it in through here, or you don't have to use um, the USB power brick. So you can, if you're using this for a 3D printer, it's really nice because you can plug it directly to your power supply for the printer instead of having to get extra cables and cords and adapters to make that work. Um, and you have the, the power step down converter built in right here, take in the, the 12 or 24 volts, step it down to the five and the three volts that the system needs. So that's a, one of my favorite features right there because you know, it's so much easier to have your power supply, especially for 3D printing, like I mentioned, um, or other setups. You know, even if you just want to do test rig, I have over here off the camera, I have just a, a, some generic uh, 24 volt power supply that I use for testing these things. And um, it, it's nice not having to make a special adapter for that. I can just screw in the cables on both sides and it's done. Um, so that was a great tip. Uh, if, if, if Big Tree Tech is watching this, thank you for doing something like that. Keep that up. Keep these going with, with that on there. Um, another interesting thing, they have an infrared port, uh, infrared uh, receiver. Uh, for 3D printing, I can't really see where that would be useful. Um, maybe so you can turn off and on your printer or some sort of function with infrared. Um, I don't know, maybe you have like a uh, pause printing if you enter the room or something. I don't know. <laughs> you can do all sorts of stuff, but it's a programmable IR. But like I was mentioning, because this isn't um, locked to 3D printing, 
if you have it as a media center, that com becomes very handy because now you have full control with the remote control. So you can program these in, you know, when you have like media center set up or whatever, you can have a, a script running in there that is uh, monitoring that. And you can program just at, at just any, any uh, uh, infrared receiver, but like an old TV remote or something like that. And you can just, you know, have it set to where when you press the button, it reads the code, it saves it, and then you can assign that specific IR code to a function and then have it every time you, it sees that func that, that IR code, it runs a function, you know, and have it to where it, it's hooked up to a stepper motor and uh, opens and closes your curtains or <laughs> um, locks and unlocks a door from, from a distance or turns off and on TV or, like I said, run a media center. So, you know, your, your imagination is really the limit. And, of course, uh, coding skills, I suppose. I, I don't have the full coding skills for all that either. But if you have good coding skills and you understand Linux, all, I mean, it's your imagination is the limit. Um, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much the bulk of it. There's really not much extra going on. It does come with this nice big heat sink, which is cool. Um, like I mentioned, it's the all winner um, H616 chip running on here. It's the system on a chip, which has a, a quad core Cortex A53, if I'm remembering correctly. It's about a 1.2, 1.3 gig, uh, I think it's 1.5 actually. Yeah, 1.5 gigahertz uh, processor, a quad core. So it's, it seems very adequate. Um, I haven't had it stall out or have any issues. Um, one gig of RAM. Would have been cool to see a little bit more, but uh, you know, even with Clipper running, it, it doesn't seem to bog down at all. Um, so yeah, the uh, Wi-Fi, as you can see, it's got the little rat tail thing sticking out. Um, it's it's a space saving thing um, to get the Wi-Fi out and away. Um, it's probably also for cutting cost that they don't have the antenna built in like a Raspberry Pi does. It has a little extender with a kind of a uh, zigzag style antenna built in if you ever look at those things. So this is an alternative way of doing it. Um, which is pretty common. Even the CM4, I believe, does that. Um, Raspberry Pi CM4 has this style. Um, and you can actually get different types to plug in. It uses the standard, I can't remember what it's called right now, but it's the little tiny round uh, clip for plugging in. And so they sell higher gain um, Wi-Fi antennas. And getting that can be a benefit um, because it, it does, this little guy does cause uh, your internet to slow down from you know your wi-fi from what's coming in so your data rate will be a little bit slower just because you're using that so if you plug in through um standard ethernet or if you get an, uh, a higher end um higher gain antenna, um, it, it works really well that being said i haven't needed it i have um you know just standard wi-fi in my house i do have little nodes i got the google nest so i got three different nodes throughout the the, the house um but i've never had a connection error so it's works works perfectly <laughs> more than adequate i haven't had any speed issues um so yeah that's that's the uh big tree tech pie in in a nutshell um i'm really happy that big tree tech is doing this I, I actually hope that they continue doing this i would like to see some more iterations maybe with more ram um the the uh, all winner h616 processor seems to be a pretty good package because it comes with a lot of stuff um like i mentioned with the hdmi output um 4k video uh, there's all sorts of different stuff that I can do and actually to keep costs down they haven't broken out all of the features um, because you know that creates more circuitry needed and more design blah 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 you have to have like uh, more layers in the board to in order to get it working so to keep the cost down which speaking of cost this thing is only like $35 or so $33 $35 um, so comparing to something like a, um, a Raspberry Pi 3B plus uh, that's actually pretty close to the same styling or the same uh, power that this has would be the most comparable would be the Raspberry Pi 3B+. Plus. Um, but comparing to the other prices for Raspberry Pis right now, um, this is a still because it's available now. It's not being scalped. So, you know, it's very easy to get. So you're not having to pay a premium or you're not having to dig around the internet. And even, you know, even if you're willing to pay the premium for it, try to find it and try to get one right away. You know, you might have to wait a few months or longer before you can even buy one. And then you're paying a premium for that price, like double the price of what it should be. So that's, that's one of the things I think is amazing for Big Tree Tech for, or amazing. One of, the, one of the things I feel is really good for Big Tree Tech to do this thing is because it's not just because it's going to help them and, you know, to sell a product, but it's, it's getting more options out into the market. You know, there's other things like the orange pie and a couple other, right? there's like, was there a potato pie or something like that? Or there, there's other boards and they, they use a similar chips. And my opinion is that that is perfect for the market, not just for keeping prices down, 
but because it shows that there's plenty of other options out there and when more boards have the same types of chips like this all winner uh, H616, there's gonna be more development for it. So, you know, one of the real nice things about uh, Raspberry Pi is that it's so well developed and, you know, the community is so massive that there's tons of projects and it's really a lot of just, you know, copy paste and you have a full blown system the way you want it without having to, to get things working. Where as sometimes with this type of stuff, if nobody's developed for it and it's just a chip that has the features, it doesn't really matter if nobody's developed because, you know, if, if it's not out there, you, you can't really do much with it. You know, yeah, it works, but if nobody's developing, then you have to figure it out on your own. Um, and so, you know, if you're not familiar with making kernels and, and getting the Linux kernel to run, you know, with with all the hardware and stuff like that, then that becomes very difficult. So Big Tree Tech putting a lot of time and effort into this. Clipper is actually, uh, or Big Tree Tech is one of Clipper's uh, biggest sponsors. And so there's a lot of partnership going on with that. So even more, um, you know, development in the background going on for these things, they're, that's, that's going to really open up a lot of options in my opinion. So I, I look forward to seeing what this goes, uh, where this gets taken. Um, like I said, I hope that more comes out. Um, my biggest hope is probably the next iteration is going to have more RAM. I'm pretty sure they're going to have an eMMC, which is, you know, instead of using the SD card, which is back here, forgot to mention, um, SD slot. It'll have like onboard storage because they've done it with the CB1 already. So you have two versions of regular SD card version or one with built-in um, uh, memory. So that would be a thing that they'll probably end up doing. But I would really like to see more RAM, at least two gigs on it, just because. Why not? You know, four gigs would be another great option. Um, but as it stands, it's pretty nice. Oh, one other thing I want to point out. You may have noticed, if you're familiar with Raspberry Pi, the GPIO pins are on the wrong side, or technically everything about the board is mirrored. So that is one drawback, I will have to say, is that the because it's mirrored, you're not going to be able to find cases too much um, that fit this. And the even though the overall size is pretty much exactly the same as a Raspberry Pi, like I said, it's mirrored. So your bolt patterns aren't going to really match up. Um, and if you have a case for a Raspberry Pi, it's not going to work on this one. Um, so yeah, there, there's limited options. That being said, I don't know if you noticed, I do have a case. I have actually designed one. Here's going to be my shameless plug and advertisement. Um, I've made a, a snap together case. So you can see I got little screws holding in for the, for the, um, for the board itself to stay into the bottom if you want to use those. It's not really required because I've made it to where the snaps, as you can see, and it holds in place now with no extra screws. And it's designed to where everything fits fairly snugly so that it kind of holds the board in place as it is. Um, the screws are nice to have though, but I've made it to where the, the can system is, is accessible. It has a place for a fan and it's got the right uh, clearance for all that for a standard Raspberry Pi 5 volt fan. GPIO is open, you got for your ribbon cable and your screen, um, the ADXL accelerometer to pass that through, and of course your power and USB. I don't know, oh yeah, and a little rat tail. And there's your a IR. So everything's been uh, designed well, I believe. <laughs> it did take me a little while to get things lined up and, and fitting really well. It prints um, nicely with no supports. Well, now I take that back. A little bit of supports here and here. I do draw on support, so it only does it there and in this part. Otherwise, nothing else needed supports. Um, printed that upside down. Now, I'm gonna put the link in the description, but I wanna disclose right away before you guys even click the link that it is a paid um, STL. It's like, a, what is it, like $1.50 or um, 150 euro, or something like that, um, which really isn't much, but um, I, I I wanted to, to put it for free, but you know, it's getting more and more difficult for me to buy these type of things for my channel, and because I don't generate any money for my channel, and um, you know, pretty much everything is just if I get donations, um, or, you know, sell little things like that. That's the only way I can continue making my channel. So I, I, I did put it for sale. Hopefully that's not a, a bad thing. Um, a bunch of people have already bought it, I saw. So thank you to that if it was any of my viewers here. Um, but yeah, the, the link is there. If you do get one and you want a case, you don't want to de design your own. Uh, this one's working pretty well so far for me. So that's an option. But anyways, what do you guys think about this? Uh, have you seen much about it? Do you have any questions about the uh, Big Tree Tech Pi? BTT Pi. Um, let me know down in the comments. I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, and I think I'm going to do another video to show you, just because I actually have some already requests of this, I'm going to show how to get this thing um, set up. It is all on their website. It is simply a matter of 
installing your ISO, the ISO that they offer is the exact same one for the CB1. So they're, they're exact same everything. It works. Put it onto your SD card using Raspberry Pi uh, Etcher or Belina, or what was that? Raspberry Pi Imager or Belina Etcher. One of those type of things to put the ISO, just like a Raspberry Pi. And then you go in after it's done uh, flashing, you go in and put the, uh, all right, open the, what is it? System config file. And then you put in your Wi-Fi password if you're gonna use Wi-Fi. Uh, make sure everything is case sensitive on that. So your both your password and the SSID, the Wi-Fi name, are both case sensitive. So make sure that's done right. Put that in there. Put it back in. Boot it up. Wait for it to boot. The first boot is actually long um, because of what it's doing is it's taking that information from the uh, system configuration and actually configuring everything and putting things into the files where they need to go and uh, you know linking things together. So the first boot is a little bit slow. It shouldn't take more than five minutes, but uh, that kind of seems like a lifetime when you're ready to do something and it's just not working. <laughs> so just to keep that in mind, but all the subsequent uh, boot after that is um, yeah, not an issue. It seems to boot up just fine, um, you know, just a few seconds or so. Uh, yeah, and that's what I'm going to do anyway. So that's, that was the gist of how to install it. Um, but I'll, I'll do a little bit more and I'll also show you how to use the CAN bus. If you guys are interested, let me know. Um, yeah, that's that's it. That's the big tree tech pie in a nutshell. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. I'm already seeing it's taking too long and I'm going to start rambling if I don't cut it off. So until next time, thank you for watching and happy printing.